If you're like me, I get excited. I hope you get in the discipline if you're not already. Bring a notepad. Bring something. Take notes. Whenever you read the Bible, ever. I love how one guy, his name is Henry Blackaby, years ago, he said, if the God of the universe speaks to you, write it down. That's a good tip, right? Just write it down. That has stuck with me since I was 18 years old. Just write it down. You never know what's going to happen. Even in spite of me, praise Jesus, if he speaks to you, write it down, man. Put that stuff, remind yourself all the time how he's moving in your life. It's really good. Uh, and it's amazing, you go back in your life, like if you're like me, you go back through the years and look back at the notes you took and go, oh, man, that was good. Or oh, that really changed my life. Or I remember that time and whatever. That, that's good stuff. So that's good stuff. So let's turn on our Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Last week, I noticed when I was re-listening to some of my sermon, I said Romans chapter 7. Sorry. And no one corrected me, which means you weren't listening or you're being so sweet. He's gone crazy. We're all over in Romans. So Matthew chapter 7. Uh, please turn in your Bible there if you have a Bible app, Matthew 7. We're ending, almost ending up the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the penultimate section, so right before the end. And next week, Dave is going to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. And you, you can't wait. The best is saved for last. I'm so excited to him to bring the heat. Sorry, I got nervous already because I mentioned it. It's coming up. So we're in Matthew chapter 7. If you've missed any of the sermon so far, uh, good for you. I'm kidding. You can go online on YouTube and all on our YouTube channel on the website at the top says YouTube channel and all the sermons are always posted no matter who preaches or speaks. It's always there on a YouTube channel so you can catch up. All the sermons that Jesus preached are either usually fall in one or two categories, right? They're either really, really encouraging, like I really need to hear that Jesus. Thank you so much. Come to me all you are weary and tired. I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. That stuff really comforts me. Then there's everything else he says, which is right up, if we're doing it well, if we're listening carefully, it's right up in our face and it's very difficult. And the Sermon on the Mount, if you agree with me, oftentimes is very difficult if we really take it seriously. And one of the most difficult parts of listening to Jesus is, if you're like me, is assuming you're not his audience. Is assuming you're not his audience. And when we think that we're always preaching for someone else, Jesus talking to someone else, it is so easy. If you're like me, to go, oh, it's not, boy, that's, get him, David. Boy, that, get him, Jesus. Man, I'm so glad. I hope my spouse is listening. Man, you are a sinner. I hope uh, next week I'm bringing that friend who needs him because I don't, oh, what, he's talking to me. And that's the difficult part of all these lessons. Listen very carefully what Jesus says. Today is no exception. It's, there's difficult texts. They're difficult. In Matthew chapter 7, if you have it, will you say Amen. All right, amen. Let's, uh, verse 13, Jesus says, this is Jesus now. Let's listen very carefully. Enter by the narrow gate. Now, Jesus is good at giving directions, all right? That's his point here. This is a, no, it's not. All right, it's a metaphor, all right? He's evoking a metaphor. Everyone understands they would have seen a gate just like this in Jerusalem. Enter by the narrow gate. If you want to make it in town correctly, enter the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is what? You can talk, what? Broad and it's easy Simple, woohoo, it's comfortable. That leads where? Naponset. Destruction. I'm sorry, I just. I might be right. <laughs> I might be right. That leads to Chicago. Amen. I know how to get some amens in the church. That leads to Chicago. Hey, or I can tell you where I grew up. Anyway, uh, that leads there. That way is easy. Listen, the easy way is easy. Everybody loves it. It goes straight to destruction. Now, imagine a town, a city called destruction. Why would you take that path? Those who enter it are many, many people love going the easy path. But the gate is narrow. And the way is what? Your translation probably says hard, difficult there. Yeah, the, trans, the Greek really is, it, uh, the word is narrow. It's idea, it, um, you might even use the word, it squeezes you. It's rough and narrow. And so translators help you out by saying they mean it, it's difficult. There's a struggle to pass through the path. It's that narrow. It's narrow and tight. It is, it's squeezy. I'll make up a word. It's in the, it's, that's a new adjective. That leads where? It leads to life. And those who find it are few. There's only a few people who find it. There's only a few. Now, if you're like me, I mean, most people don't like being up in someone's grill all the time. They're walking down the road, and they like to bump, bump, bump. Not everyone likes to bump all the time. Most people like some distance. So we see these kind of paths there. We see it go in the mall or something, if they even have malls anymore. All right, you open the door. We like big, broad, open areas, the airport, you know, just kind of there's personal space. Everyone likes that. I remember when I was, my very first time I went to Mardi Gras in New Orleans, and I was probably about seven years old, I guess it was. And I, it might have been the first time I had the flu, but I was I mean, it's a horrible sinus infection. I felt bad, bad that night. 
and that kind of parents I have, they took me anyway to Mardi Gras because, hey, the club never stops. And I'm kidding. My dad's here, so I'm giving him a hard time. So, but I was, I was sick that. So I walk up, and people were so tight in Mardi Gras. They were so tight. If I remember correctly, I mean, it felt just like it, they picked me off the ground. And I remember going, it scared me. Like, where's the ground? And I fell down. It was that tight. Jesus says, nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be that tight. They want space. They want to make sure it's easy. There's plenty of space. And Jesus says, it's just like that in life. It's just like that. He put his finger right on the human condition and says, Does it, isn't it true that we all want to choose the easiest path? How many of you have asked God to make your life harder? Raise your hand. Really? If you've ever asked God to bring on the suffering so that it shapes you more to be like Jesus? Nobody likes the narrow paths. Nobody wants to be squeezed. Isn't it true that most of the time you're mad at God, you're mad because you really expected the path to be easy? You expected the job to come exactly when you thought, the paycheck to come when you thought, that the marriage would happen when you thought, it would be restored the way you thought, your kid wouldn't get on drugs like you thought, so-and-so wouldn't die like you thought. When the struggle, when the struggle's real, you don't want this, no one wants struggle. Jesus knows that perfectly well. He knows that perfectly well, and he says, that's why few people take the right path. Far, far, far fewer people in the real world around the globe will find the right gate, the right path, and that's Jesus. And accept his squeezy teachings, his tight, difficult, hard teachings. Very few people are going to make it and find life on the other side. Jesus' point is we'd be real mistaken if you looked at the size of the path of how easy it was and welcoming it was and how comfortable it was and think it leads to the right spot, we'd be mistaken. You can't look at how easy it is and how comfortable it is, no matter how much you might want, on it, and want it, and think it leads to the right spot. Jesus says, man, I know the easy way is always attractive. So here's the question so far. How many of you in this room have yet to even think about yourself in this audience? Because when Jesus spoke this, he spoke to fellow Jews, and every single one of them would have thought they were on the narrow path. Everyone thought that. Everyone, because Jews thought that all the time. That my, they would say, like in Matthew chapter three, we have Father Abraham as our father. I don't what? Jesus looks at the very people they think they're on the right path and says, I'm telling you, most of y'all, he's Southern, and yes, and he's Jesus, so he said y'all, most of y'all are on the wrong path. And the reason why you're on the wrong path is you're not ready to get stretched and squeezed because my teachings are going to make it difficult for you. And you want to reject them. You don't like it. Jesus found that in his ministry all the time. Remember in John chapter 6 when Jesus tells them, and by metaphor, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. Now that sounds disgusting no matter when you say it. Jesus knew that. Especially for a Jew, cannibalism is a horrible sin. And it says, and many left him. Many left him. It says because the teaching was too difficult. So many people leave him all the time. They still do. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 4 and in Luke and Matthew. It tells like a parable of a sower of a seed. He gets these seed. He, there's different kinds of soil. Remember this story? He throws the seed down. Some seed grows up. It says, and the sun scorches it. Later on, he describes the disciples. That's a metaphor for being persecuted. And they fall away. They fall. The word is scandalized. They sin. They fall away. They don't want to be persecuted. But Jesus said explicitly in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who are persecuted. For my name's sake. Woo! For so are the prophets. Remember that? Remember that sermon? For, I know you do. You memorized every one of these sermons. You sleep at night. I'm kidding. I know you sleep at night. Some of y'all tell me, I listened to your sermon, and boy, I fell asleep. Sorry. Like, you're not the first person to tell me that. That's soporific. Yeah, I know. Some of you right now. Listen, it's all about Jesus, not me. Are you sure you're on the right path? Are you sure? Because if you're like me, right now you've tuned out a lot of this to say it's for other people. Like the earliest Jews did. Are you sure you're on the right path? Are you sure you are? Because the road that leads to destruction is so much wider, more comfortable. And we can sit back, which we'll talk about later on, in confessions of faith, or we think we're doing the right thing. And in fact, what we're really doing in the root, listen, man, I get it. I'm a human being just like all. As soon as this service finishes, you go down those stairs, you go out in the real world, you go back. If nothing changes in your life to be more like Jesus, then you are on the wide path of destruction. 
if in the real world it doesn't make real world difference in your life that you are a disciple of Jesus, then you're not a disciple of Jesus. I mean, you can shout as loud as you want, saying, oh, the harmony's perfect. Does, that stuff doesn't matter. The easy path is what we all want. And Jesus says, far few people find the right one. I mean, that's a mic drop. Boom. Far few people find it. Are you on the right path? Are you attempting to escape the teaching of Jesus in some area of your life or areas of your life? Because it's just too hard. It's too squeezy. I don't, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. And you get all, you get, you get most, you get half of me. These parts are my own. I can't fathom telling my wife that on a wedding day. I can't fathom my vows. I've been to so many weddings and I've officiated so many times. Oh, I love you to the ends of the earth and you get most of me. Amen. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy. And that's what happens, of course, as soon as marriage goes bad, we want to go bail, we run, run, because we want easy, easy, easy. And Jesus says, far few people find it. Far few people find it. Then Jesus said, well, why would a person want to do, why would a person want to do the difficult thing and find the narrow path? I think about sometimes the Navy SEALs. Why would the SEALs want to go through a boot camp when they tell them, I'm telling you, at the boot camp, most of you will not successfully navigate this course. You will not make it. Our goal is to make sure you do not. I want to kick 90% of you out. I don't want people who can't make this course out there responsible for other lives. I, why would you want to do that? We well, ask a Navy SEAL that. Why do you? They've asked the documentaries. You can ask Navy SEALs. I've asked them. Oh, it's kind of cool to see if you can make it the cream of the crop. I like to blow things up. I mean, there's different reasons to find out why they do it. But in Christianity, the answer is why would you do that? Why would you deliberately want to go to a course? When the instructor of the course says, most of you won't find the right path. I can think of at least two reasons for me. I don't know what your reasons are, if you're even interested. I think of two reasons. These are the reasons why I'm trying to find that narrow, hard, squeezy path. One is because I think Christianity is true. I really do think Jesus really existed, ushered in the kingdom of God, died, for, rose from the dead, and is reigning a lot. I really do think it's true, and I think there's really good historical reasons to believe it's true. I like to believe in things that are true. So that's, that's number one. The second reason is because I want life. I want life. I don't want destruction. And if, if, if those, they follow naturally. So if I started number two and said, I want to live, well, then where do I go? Great, that's back to step number one. But step number one tells me, I found a person I'm convinced knows what he's talking about. He's not delusional or an idiot or evil. I think he can trust him to tell me which way to go, and that's exactly where I'm going to go. Are you sure you're on the right path? That's the question. Then Jesus gives a few examples of people who are not on the right path. Now, these are people in the time period others would have thought they're on the right path. They thought that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Then Jesus says, you with me? Amen. Beware of... False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but they're inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. They are dangerous, they'll eat you. Of course, a metaphor, right? You will know them by their fruits. You will know the false prophets by their fruits. Then he says, are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? Of course, the answer is absolutely not. And I'll talk about that more in a second. No, they're not, not at all. Listen, so every sound or healthy tree, it, it literally in Greek, it's not bears good fruit, what your translation says, it's does good fruit. Literally, it's does good fruit. Every healthy tree does good fruit. That's the point. We'll talk about that more in a second. But the bad tree does evil fruit. Bears, it produces, it does bad evil fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear or do evil fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Jesus' point, of course, is you're going to know exactly when you look at a prophet. You'll know because it will naturally flow out of them whether or not they are my disciple. Now, what in the world is a prophet? I've got to talk about prophets just for a second. And I won't nerd out too much, but I want to. Uh, because this is a huge common misconception in the church. And I've worked in, I think, five denominations. Everyone gets usually this wrong. Prophet in American English means fortune teller. Oh, you were a prophet. The stock did go up. It did go down. In American English, that's fine. It means future teller. That's not what it means in the Bible. That's not at all. In Hebrew, Navi, Greek, prophetis, it did not mean future teller. It meant spokesperson. That's all it means. Someone who speaks for someone else. If I say, Hayden, my son, please go tell Julia, my daughter, go tell her dinner's ready. Hayden comes in and says, dinner's ready. He's been a prophet. He's been a prophet. That's it. 
I call him that, Prophet Hayden, whenever he gets the message right. Now, it might be dinner's right in five minutes, so it's about the near future. That's fine. But it's not about the distant future. He's just conveying a message. And ancient Jews and all ancient people, Egyptians, Mesopotamians, everybody had prophets. Everybody did. Jews were no exception. They had prophets and prophetesses, females. And they saw them as people who came out of the heavenly courts. Like there was a secret meeting, and then there's an announcement. I think about that sometimes when I watch press conferences of the White House. So they ask, uh, you know, what did, does the president have any plans for X, Y, Z? Or what about this? And she says, this morning we had a meeting and we asked that exact question and here's what he said. See, we're eavesdropping on a conversation, a secret top-level conversation. Only a few people were there. And now someone's regaling the message of what was happening in the courts. That's exactly how they thought about Jew, uh, prophets. They came from God's heavenly court, not literally geographically, but that God spoke to them a message and they had a vision or a message they got. They eavesdrop on a conversation and now they've got to go tell the Jews about it. About 1%, literally, they've done studies, about 1% of the prophecies are about the distant future. About 99% of it is about the immediate context and immediate future. When the Christians did this, stay with me, because you might not have ever heard about a prophet before. In the early church, we see this in 1 Corinthians 12, Acts 13, Ephesians 4, other places. The church divided in hierarchy who was the most authoritative in the early church. Okay? The most authoritative were the apostles. Because the apostles were Jesus' original disciples, the original team. So they're the most authoritative. Sometimes they call them the pillars because they're the ones who are the immediate access to the teaching of Jesus. They're the top of the food chain. The second are prophets. Because the assumption was that the risen Jesus will still give the messages to use to the church. And then it was teachers and evangelists. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12 and, of course, Ephesians 4. He says, first apostles, second prophets, and so forth. And prophets would be like a local prophet, like Hill Church has a prophet. And some prophets had, they went from different churches and they circulated different places. And they would show up and say, I've got a word from the Lord today. Well, how do you know that they're telling the truth? I mean, how do you, hmm. She sounds good. He sound, how do you know? Jesus said, here's how you can tell. Some of these people will get me right. They'll represent my teaching correctly and they'll do good fruit. They will live a lifestyle according to exactly what I taught. Then there's going to be a people, not who just get it wrong, they made a mistake, but people who deliberately were trying to deceive. These are dangerous. And you'll know them by their fruit. Now, in Israel, these are the exact grapes. I was there this week to take this picture for y'all on the right side, and it's a Christian lie, I'm just kidding, just a joke. So grapes, on the right, that is from Israel, on the left side are the figs, right? They don't come from thorns, they don't come from thistles. They don't, there's a particular plant and grapes don't have thorns. They don't have that. The point is, it will flow naturally out of them. They, it will flow out, you know, back in the 80s, there was a snack that was all the junk kids called Fig Newtons. Remember the Fig Newtons? Had little seeds in them. I kind of like the blueberry ones. The other ones are kind of, I don't know. It mean an old person to ask about fig newtons. Those are popper. Well, on the left side, those are figs from a particular sycamore tree in Israel. So when he's asked the question, hum, it's like saying, can you get a corn stalk from an old bean crop for all you farmers? The answer, of course, is never, 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 genetically impossible. Can't plant corn and beans pop out. Never going to happen. What if I plant an apple seed Will pumpkins come out? Never in a million years. Jesus said, that's my point. That's my point. If you've got a person who's given their life to Jesus and they've said, he's, I've surrendered everything to him, I'm obedient to him, his Holy Spirit's inside of me, it will flow naturally out that you're hearing the word from God. That biblical teacher or prophet or preacher, you'll know exactly what they're saying is true. Otherwise, you've met a wolf. And these dangerous wolves can talk like they're inspired, but they're dangerous. And they are dangerous. And you'll know them by paying attention carefully to what they teach and how they behave. And we know in Deuteronomy 18, how do we know a false prophet? There in Deuteronomy 18, it says a false prophet is when the prophecy just doesn't come to pass. That's not what Jesus says. It's not just one doesn't come to pass. Jesus said, you'll know it because they don't bear fruit. Basically, you, they, you can tell he's not teaching and doing what I said. You need to know, therefore, the teachings of Jesus to spot the wolf. 
A wolf in sheep's clothing is not just a person who got something wrong, who misinterpreted a text, who just happened to sin. Listen, listen. Oh, prophets, teachers, preachers, they fall from grace and all that. Not people, oh, that's not the point. Jesus does not have, have in mind people who fail. He has in mind people who are deliberately out to deceive. And they'll put on a good Christian front, but they don't want you to be like Jesus. They want something else from you. They might want your money. They might want fame. They might want a lot of attention. They might want women or men. They might want to use you to sell a lot of books. And I thought about listing several names, but I won't, of people who are very popular preachers these days. And I'm not talking about people who just mean well and we might disagree with some theology. Oh, my goodness. In fact, it's frustrating and sad to me that Christians can find these popular big preachers because they're, they're easy targets. And they can say the most horrible things about them the Christians have no business saying. It's one thing to disagree with their theology here and there. That's fine. But some of this person, blah, blah. But having said that, nevertheless, we should be very, very, very cautious of the people we listen to, including now. I am no authority like Jesus is. I'm a nobody, but I know the somebody as best as I know how to know him. And the goal is to listen carefully to what they say and how they live. I'm not talking about they sin sometimes. You're finding out, and this is hard for us Christians to realize, I have met some wolves in my life. Praise God, not many, but I've met some wolves in churches. I have met them. There's, they're, they're, they've done research on them. There's actually a particular psychological profile on these people. They're there. And we've got to be cautious, not only not to be one, but to watch carefully because they are ravenous wolves who seek to hurt. They seek to hurt. So who are you listening to? If someone says, I got a word from the Lord today, which podcast are you listening to? Which sermon are you listening to? David, I don't know what. I'm a baby Christian. I understand it can be difficult. But to know a counterfeit, you've got to know the real deal. You've got to listen to Jesus. You've got to know the Gospels. If you don't know where to start at all, find someone who does. Find a mature Christian you know. Ask me, hey, is this person any good? I'm, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I think. And I will try my always best to be nuanced. Well, I do appreciate this, 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 but when he or she says these kind of things, I, I, that's, that, that seems to me not represent Jesus. But again, I'm not, we don't need to have just one person you want to listen to. But my point is, that's the kind of stuff we listen to. Be careful about that. You and I can be very, very gullible. And Jesus says, don't be gullible. Be as wise or shrewd as serpents, but as innocent as, you hear the metaphor? So we can't be gullible about that. Then Jesus goes on. We're almost done. Jesus wrap up this. Here's another person we thought. Surely, surely all the prophets would be on the narrow path. Surely they would. They, I got a word from the Lord today. Jesus says, no, some of them aren't either. Some of them aren't either. Some of them really are wolves, and they are on the broad path. They're trying to deceive you. They're not going to make it. What about this last category of person? A lot of persons. Jesus isn't done. If you're not offended yet, good. We're almost there. Verse 21, your time's coming. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's a cries of affirmation, right? Lord, you're the Lord. Lord means, listen, let's keep this real simple. Lord means boss, master. That's all it means. There's, there's no other churchies about it. It means boss or master. Boss, or not friend, not buddy, not slave, not Santa Claus, not Oprah, Lord. Okay. Shall enter the kingdom of heaven. See the entrance language? Not everyone who cries out the right words to me will enter. But he who does, like does bear good fruit, does the good fruit, here it's does the will of my Father. It means the same thing. Who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. On that day, and he means judgment day, and judgment day is coming. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That's what he just talked about. And cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Golly, if you're like me, I sure hope David preaches this for other people. Jesus is saying, like in Matthew 5, 20, he says, unless your righteousness exceed the Pharisees, that is, that's not good enough. Your own righteousness isn't good enough. Prophetic speech isn't good enough. Proper professions of faith, Lord, Lord. James says this explicitly in James 2, 14. Faith without works is what? It is dead. You can, you can say you love Jesus and you're Christian to your nose bleeds. It is irrelevant. 
people who have actually believe in God and Jesus and they're Christians and they give their life to him will act like it. That's Jesus point of the fruit. They're going to act like it. You can't, it's impossible to act. They're impossible. C.S. Lewis said, it's like asking which blade of pair of scissors is more important. I think he's right. You, you can't, scissors are two together. Nor exercising demons, nor performing power acts. That means we say the word miracle, but in Greek it's a power act, a mighty act. It's sufficient for entrance into the age to come. Authentic, real disciples will do what he wants, and they will follow Jesus' teaching. You and I can be duped. We can dupe ourselves by thinking, I have served at church, worked at church, I do my devotionals, and it becomes this checklist. And we can have all the outward signs of like spiritual gifts. And Jesus says, none of those things mean you're my disciple. Those might be outworkings of it, great, but that doesn't mean you're doing what God wants by being obedient to me. You can use some of the things I train you to do, disciples, exercising and do and so forth, for other purposes. I can teach you how to exercise a demon, and you do it for, for yourself. You do it to be famous. The famous exerciser, that's not at all what I want. I can teach you that you, you can learn tricks. You can learn magic. You can dupe all kinds of people. These things will not count. They won't make it. None of these things. So if you're not offended yet, now you should be. Even confessions of faith alone are not enough. Lord, Lord, didn't we do all this stuff in your name and your authority? Yeah, but I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know you. I know about you. The only way to know a person is to get to know them. If you want to know what God's will is, you've got to talk to them. You've got to get to know them. They'll say, here's exactly what I want. Here's exactly what I want. So what's your relationship like to Jesus? Really think about that for a second. Just for a second, and we're done. What is your relationship like with Jesus on this part? Because some of you, I know because I've been in ministry for a long time, I've met people in this church. Some of you say, well, yeah, I believe in God. Cool. I mean, I hope you believe that God exists. The only problem with that is it doesn't make you a disciple, right? Because demons believe God exists. They're not disciples of Jesus. Satan believes in God. He, he's not a Christian. So that can't count. Well, I was baptized as a baby. Good. That doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. That just doesn't. Uh, my, my, my parents believe in God. They, they used to take me to church as a kid. Good. I'm glad they do. And I'm glad you went to church. That doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. Well, I'm a good person. Good. You're not really, but good for you. Because what you mean by, what you mean by being good is, and everybody does this. Everyone doesn't mean they're good. What they mean is I'm better than. Because what you do is you evoke someone in your mind you think you're better than. Because we're all a little self-righteous. When you say I'm good, at least I'm not like. Good for you. Now put the like Jesus and now see how, you, now see how it fares out. It's not good enough. You're not good, number one. Let's say you are good. Great. That doesn't make you a Christian. I work hard. I go down a list. I support my family. These things don't work. Well, David, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. Yeah, well, homes aren't Christian. People are. But I understand the point. How is it? Wood and mortar doesn't turn to Jesus. But so you can't be surrounded by that. Now think about that for a second. David, are you married? I am married. When did you get married? I've always been married. I was grew up in a married home. What? I was married to Elaine when I was a baby. No, you what? No, you weren't. I've just always believed in Elaine. Well, good. I believe in Elaine. Am I married to her too? This is silly. Well, I can't go to an exact minute. That's fine. Was there a time you went from single to married? Was there some season in your life where you went, man, I gave up dating? If the answer is no, you're not a disciple of Jesus. You're just not. You're not. The narrow way, few find it. The broad way is full of professions of faith and I was growing up in this ham family and I believe in God and all the just pablum, the nonsense we say in America that makes us think we're believers, that stuff doesn't work. To be a disciple of Jesus, you have got to confess all that you are is not good. He is all that you need. You give your life to him completely. And I mean, you've got to surrender everything. Lord Jesus, you don't get part of me, some of me, and you get all, like I'm getting married. You don't get part of my heart, Elaine, romantically speaking. She gets all my heart romantically. She, I go all in with Jesus. He's everything. He gets my wallet, my schedule, 
my eyeballs, everything I look at and listen to, he gets all of that. Well, David, I'm not going to be like, I'm not perfect. And so maybe some of you right now haven't given your life to Jesus. And people who watch online haven't given your life to Jesus totally. And, and th- I'm talking, I'm up in your face. And I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you are disciples of Jesus and you're baby Christians. And you're like, David, I can't spot a false prophet yet because I don't know his teaching yet. And I, oh, this makes me nervous. I'm not sure. Well, if you're not sure, get sure. I'm sure I'm married, outside of being delusional, but I don't think I'm delusional. Does Lane exist? Okay, I think she does, and she's here and wears a ring. But outside of that, I know I'm married. There comes a time when you know that you know. Why? Because I've given my life to Jesus. I give my life to Jesus. There's never a time I wake up and go, I'm single today. There's never a time I wake up and say, I'm a non-Christian today. My life is his. And with failure, with failure, with sin involved, unfortunately, even with that, our relationship is still solid. Our relationship's not at stake. He picks us back up and says, now try again. But I surrender everything to him. And one thing that might help you, instead of giving you a list of all things you can do, because I don't know where you're at, because I don't know all of you one-on-one, one thing I would encourage you, if you don't know the teaching of Jesus yet, is to get to know it, read the Gospels. But here's a good mirror, metaphorically speaking. I designed this a few years ago, a mirror. And I'll call it a discipleship assessment, okay? And it's to help you Get to see yourself a little better. That's it. So what I've done is I've broken into mind, heart, and body, and I use you know, Bible verses and so forth. And it's just a little you know, metaphorical mirror that you fill out yourself. You rate yourself 0 to 10. 0 to 10. And then you give a plan of action, a course of action on the bottom of it. Now, my hope and goal is, now right now this morning, the first service took almost all of them, which is great. There's a couple left, so run, Diane, as fast as you can. Now, we will print out more. That was a good sign. I didn't know how many people would take them. They took a lot, which is great. I will print out plenty, and I can email it to you. If you want me to email, I don't care. This is for you. My hope and prayer is you will take this. You'll fill it out. At minimum, you'll go over it. At minimum, you'll reflect on your own sorrow. But my next step hope is this. My hope is that you'll find at least one trusted, safe, non-judgmental person to show it to and say, man, here are my numbers. I don't have to see yours, but what'd you get? No, yeah, what'd you, I've got a three. I, I need help. I never even thought about that one. Dude, I'm like a negative sum. I don't know. Now that one I think I'm doing well on. You think I'm doing well on that one? What do you think? And here's my plan of action, because one was to call Bob to see if he would, he would pray for me or do a Bible study or recommend resources or I'm going to meet with so-and-so. Will you do that for me? And if you don't have that one person who can be non-judgmental and safe and whatever, I would be honored to be that person for you. You need to find a person who's safe and loving and says, I also have given my life to Jesus and I want to grow up, and it's time to grow up. And soon this service will be finished. We'll go downstairs. The connection will be turned off on Facebook. And everything goes back to normal. And the routines of life will be right up on our face so hard all over again. The dynamics at home, the conversations you have, the things you turn on the TV will be right up on us all over again. And the question will be, which path are you on? Which path are you on? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we need your help, of course, every day. But right now, especially for those who don't know you, Oh, Holy Spirit, please work inside them right now and stir in there a conviction that would draw them to your love and grace. Let them know what they've been missing in a love relationship with you. For those that do know you, Lord Jesus, we ask for your constant um, courage to get back up, to keep going forward, to, Lord, we just want to be like you. On our best days, we do. On our worst days, we don't at all. So we're asking that you would give us, pick us back up, Uh, surrender all all over again, wherever it is we need to be surrendered throughout the week. So the routines of life don't dictate what we do and how we think and how we behave, but you do. You do dictate for us because we know from you is a source of all hope, purpose, joy, and forgiveness that we need so desperately. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, of course, we pray. Amen.